you hear that it's a step that one. All right, now how many of you, you know, got a lot from last week's session on men? That was a man, right, on Abraham. And I think it's amazing because one thing that really hits me is this is this topic about faith. You know, and I, I, I once questioned myself and say, why is God moved by faith? And I realized that faith is the opposite from our own actions, our own efforts to try to win, to try to win God's favor, which is why I think that even today, as we go through the second installment, which is about women in the Bible, it will really inspire you that these women really demonstrate straighted faith, especially faithfulness. Now, we have two very interesting characters, all right? There's Rahab and there's Mary Magdalene. In fact, in the genealogy of Christ from Matthew chapter 1, in verse, um, uh, the, the first chapter of the, the Bible, it should, tells you five characters, five women who are mentioned in Jesus' genealogy. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure if any of you know any of them, all right? If you do, type into the chat. I would love to see if you have any insights to any of these people. One of them happens to be Rahab. The other one is actually Mary. The second person mentioned at five. The second one is Mary, but not this Mary Magdalene, okay? Mary, the mother of Jesus. And it's interesting how God chose Mary, even through the lineage of not just Mary, where the, where, where the Messiah would come, from the, from the lineage of, of David, all the way to Abraham, all the way up. But also through the husband as well, through Joseph. That's how Jesus' lineage came from both husband and wife. All right. But ultimately, Jesus' father was not Joseph. He was actually conceived by the Holy Spirit. But we're not going to talk about that Mary today. We're talk, we're going to talk about Mary Magdalene. So let's start first with Rahab. Okay. Now, I'm sure a lot of you are quite familiar with this story. It goes into Joshua chapter 2 before they entered into the promised land. Now, just to give you a bit of background, the children of Israel have been wandering in the wilderness for 40 years, okay, wandering. And finally, now they are going into the land, all right? And Joshua sends out two spies into Jericho, which is a stronghold for this land. Right? So when he sends them now, they came to Rahab the harlot's house. Now, this is all within Joshua 2, uh, the, first, the, the first few verses. And the spies came into Rahab's, Rahab the harlot's house. And it's interesting how they actually mention her being a harlot. Maybe that was a, a, a way of entering the house without stirring any suspicion that they were spies. However, suspicion was actually stirred up because the king of Jericho then, he asked Rahab, he knew about these spies, and he, he asked Rahab to bring out the spies, but she quickly hid them in, in a pile of flax. Okay? And then what happens was that Rahab was quite smart. She admitted the men came, but they fled the city. All right? And from the picture you see, right, she, she even advised these pursuers, the king's men, to quickly overtake them outside the, the, the city wall. And knowing that the gates were going to be closed, they'll be out for many, many hours, then they will be totally thrown off the scent, right? And not be able to find the two spies because they were still hiding in the roof of Rahab. Now, after that, Rahab goes to, when the, when the pursuers are, are long gone, Rahab opens up the flax and, and, and the covering of the two spies. And there is a very interesting discourse. And I think it's quite interesting because what happens is that Rahab starts to share a testimony. She confessed how the Lord had given Israel the land and the victory for Israel against the enemies. And it's quite, why I say all these things is because but from the testimony, right, she, she recounts the stories of what God did to deliver Israel from the Egyptians when Moses opened up the Red Sea. I'm sure you remember that. And the Amorite kings and all the inhabitants that were against Israel, they faced uh, uh, annihilation and they faced defeat 
whenever they faced up in Israel. And it's interesting because this is something that the the the, the uh, they didn't tell her about it. This is the she's part of the enemy's camp, Rahab, right? She's part of Jericho, resident of Jericho. But instead of them trying to win her her favor, she's telling them about how good their God is, if you see that. And then she even confesses, you know, upon hearing the, the, upon hearing the things over here, um, oops, sorry, don't know what happened. Upon hearing these things, this is what Rahab is recounting, our hearts melted for the Lord your God, he is God in heaven above and on earth beneath. Now, if you remember years ago, before they even were thinking about entering into the promised land, they sent out spies earlier, right? But they came back with a bad report. Only Joshua and Caleb came back with a good report. But the bad report was like this. They were saying, yes, the land that God has given us is exceedingly good. But then they turned things around. They started to make God look bad, make God look as if he is not willing to bless his children. And then they started to talk about the size, the, the, the strength, the power of the enemies, like the Amalekites, uh, no, sorry, uh, the Nephilim, the, the giants of the land. And they say that this land is devours in its, its inhabitants. Now, Joshua and Caleb were the only two spies who went up against that word, right? The negative report. And they said that, you know what? They are bread for us. The 10 spies say that we are like grasshoppers before them. But these two men against the negative report say that, no, God has already given us up the, given up the land for us. And they are like bread for us. And what do we do with bread? We eat it. It gives us strength. So whatever that is, it, that it seems to be a problem that seems insurmountable, that seems like even that a giant that we're facing, do you know that it's them who are cowering in fear to us? Look at these two, these, these things that Rahab is saying, the testimonies think about recounting the goodness of God and even confessing that God is melting down the enemies, melted down their hearts, and that he, God, is God of heaven above and on earth beneath. So this is from the enemy who is saying all these things. I just wanted to share that, you know, friends, this is an opportunity for you to know that, you know, you are more than overcomers. In the situation that you're in, no enemy is too big for you. It's little too big for God. God is in you and the enemy is, is like, like Joshua and Caleb said, they are bread for us. You consume it, you use it as a strength and your power to give you life and give you energy. Now, it's very interesting because falling from there, the, there is a discussion, there is a, 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 a negotiation between the spies just before they leave Rahab's house. Now, Rahab said that, you know, I will do whatever it is to protect you, right? To protect whatever that you're doing. However, she said, can you please take care of my family? And then the spies tell her to actually use the same rope that she lowered them out of her house, down the window, down the city wall, for their escape, that rope to leave it hanging. I'm sure you remember the story of when the children of Israel invaded into Jericho. They marched around six times and seven times. They, 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 they shouted for joy. And then you see this picture, the walls of Jericho came tumbling down, except this singular tower with a little scarlet cord there. And the reason why she hung in there was so that everybody could see that that house had salvation. That house had made a pact, had, made, had, 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 had uh, stood on the promises of what the man had, had, had said earlier on, that they will protect Rahab's house, Rahab and her household. This is a way of salvation. And the scarlet cord, friends, really talks about Jesus. And it's, and, and, and it's the way of salvation. This is, is, is a symbol of it. You can imagine, right, that the cross, 
you see the blood hanging down. And it's a feel of promise because the third point I want to say is that a sign that everybody can see. Everybody from a distance as they saw that wall. Everybody all over Israel, outside of Jerusalem, saw Jesus hanging, dying openly for our sins, being the ultimate sacrifice, not hiding, not seen by, not in a situation that nobody sees, but everybody sees the shame, the torture, the, um, the, 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 the pain that he went through. And it's public. Also, red represents the blood of sacrifice. It's mentioned, the color there is that, why, why is it a red, scar, uh, scarlet, scarlet is all red, right? It's all really, it's really very, very strong and apparent. You can see it from a distance. And it goes to show you that we never have to fear. It wasn't our blood. It wasn't the limitations of our human sacrifice. No, nothing we can do can ever be good enough because our sin is, our, our, our blood is tainted. But the blood of Jesus, untainted, the blood of God himself without sin, is the ultimate sacrifice for us. And finally, this is the covenant of grace. This is the sign. Did, you look at Rahab's life. Rahab, right from the onset, mentions her as a, a harlot. And, I, and, I, and I'm really grateful for these stories in the Bible. You know, the Bible doesn't try to you know, uh, embellish information. It's very real. But it describes people, men and women, who have failed. But the important thing, friends, is that they never remain failed. They saw God's grace. And it's why their names are written in the Bible. Their lives are written as an example for us. Because whatever sin that this woman was, she was of great sin. But yet, because she believed God, she found a way of salvation. And was counted to her for righteousness. Now, she, if you see, right, um, in, in um in Hebrews chapter 11, we know Hebrews chapter 11 for it's very famous because it's called the Hall of Faith. All the famous heroes of faith is there. And lo and behold, even Rahab the harlot is included in this story. And they say, you know, by faith, she stepped out of her comfort zone. She stepped out of, and she risked her life to open up a house to to, to pro provide protection to these men, these spies. And because of that, by faith, she was counted for righteousness. And also in this famous chapter, James chapter 2, talks about, do you see that faith was working together with his works? And by works, faith was made perfect. See, faith can be made perfect. And that's true works, not dead works. Faith can be made perfect because of good works. And I'll continue on and you can see how they work together. And the scripture was fulfilled, which says, Abraham believed God and he was counted to him for righteousness. And he was called the friend of God. You see then that a man is satisfied, is justified by works and not by faith only. Likewise, was not Rahab, the harlot, also justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out another way. Now, they don't just count for faith righteousness. Over here, she believed God, but she acted on it. And friends, yes, we are believers of grace, and we know that we're justified by faith. We're made righteous by faith. Nothing that we can do Ephesians 2 verse 8 to 10 says that we have been saved by grace, not by works. Not that anyone can boast. For we are God's masterpiece. We are the workmanship of God and his work in us. He who has began a good work in us. Hey, friends, he's not done yet. He still is continuing to work in and through you, in and through me. And that in itself, works and faith are working together. And I think it's important that we don't just see 
do, we don't just see about, do we don't just look at grace only. It's important that we realize that when we know that we stand on righteous ground because of God's grace, we know that a effect, a fruit of it, a fruit of us walking this victorious life will result in us being able to show good fruit, being able to show that we're able to bless people around us. They may not see Jesus, but they see Jesus through you. So that is such a beautiful opportunity that every one of us has that we can actually go out there and share the goodness of God in our lives. I like what Pastor Yusuf preached on Sunday, and I think it's, it's um, you know, he talked about the simple little steps of obedience that we take. Because we are already saved. But what about the world out there? What about people who may even be Christians, but they don't, they're, they're living in, they're living in sin or they're struggling and they're not experiencing the abundant life that Jesus has for them. But friends, we are that. We, we can show good fruit in our lives. We can show that we don't just believe in our minds, but our hands, our feet, our mouth are used as instruments of righteousness that we're able to make a great effect to people when we take up the courage to share. And this is an example of how Rahab was so courageous. She risked her life for these men because she believed God and she acted on it. Now, what else can we see from this story? We move on to the next one, which is about Mary. Now, for the longest time, Mary, the Mary in the Bible is confusing. If you're asking me, I never really understood the other character, this person, Mary, because friends, there's so many Marys. All right, all right, there's Mary, the mother of Jesus. As I, as I did some study, I realized that there's so many Marys and Mary is a very common name in the Bible, in, in, in biblical times, even to, to, to today, uh, Miriam in the original Hebrew. It's like, for example, in, in TNCC, uh, you throw a stone, you hit a John, right? There's John Wong, John Chan, John Hing, you know, uh, John Nemo, so many Johns. It's a very popular name. But the thing is that during the time, it doesn't mean that only one person had the name Mary. Okay, so it was a very popular name. But there is a distinction, and, and, and in the past, people often mistake which Mary, right? So now we're specifically talking about Mary Magdalene. Sorry, everything is coming up now. Everything, I tried to make it come out slowly, okay? But this is a story that is to debunk some myths, all right? There are two stories of Jesus, of a woman pouring out her heart, her, her washing Jesus' feet and using her hair. However, I just want to highlight to you, these are actually two different stories and two different Marys. I think it's important because we need to understand that the original Mary Magdalene is often confused. They even attribute this story of Luke chapter 7 to Mary Magdalene. In effect, the person, the, the, the woman of great sin in the story of in this story is actually not named at all. All right? Another story of Jesus, of, of a woman using her hair and wiping it and, and anointing Jesus is Mary of Bethany. Another Mary. Confusing in it, isn't it? But just pay, pay attention that the first story that I'm mentioning is not anybody named, but there was a, 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 a Pope. His name is Pope Gregory the Ninth. He made an awful mistake in 591 AD by linking every Mary to one person. So he had this, the, he had this theory that the, 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 the sinner who, the woman of great sin, who washed Jesus' feet with the hair, with the tears, wiped, wiped it with the hair, and anointed Jesus, is the same Mary as Mary of Bethany, is the same woman who was caught in the sin of adultery. Uh, he didn't sit down in a midweek like you, to actually understand that this 
two accounts are two separate people, okay? Now, I think you're very blessed because this is not even in the internet where I put this out in the table so that you can see clearly, all right, that there are two separate accounts and one Mary in this, another person who is assumed to be Mary is unnamed. I don't want to postulate to say that it's actually Mary, but if the Bible need name it, I shall not name it, okay? Now, it's two different houses as well. One is Lazarus where Mary and her sister Martha lived with the brother Lazarus. The other house of this, this great sinner coming is, is the house of a Pharisee. Now, even the occasion is different, all right? This sinner brought an alabaster box. Now, we understand that alabaster box is something that a woman, a virgin, keeps it specially for her wedding, and she opens it. It's a, it's a perfume. It's a beautiful smelling perfume meant for the, her wedding day. Spikenard is a different thing. Mary of Bethany brought a costly oil of spikenard. Two of them have different occasions. Mary prepared Jesus for burial, whereas the alabaster box was actually this woman saying that, I'm a great sinner. I have, uh, I have been, um, maybe I have not been pure in terms of my relationships. And what happens is that I want... I believe that Jesus is, is the gracious Savior. And he is the one, the ultimate man I want to marry in my spirit. So she sacrifices it like a year's wage because <clears throat> it's very costly. Imagine a woman saves up all her life to, to buy this extremely expensive gift for her wedding. And she, she, she doesn't save it. She, she sees how precious Jesus is. And because of it, as they do it, the Pharisees obviously are standing on the side and thinking, oh, this man, Jesus, if he's a prophet, do you know what kind of woman this is? But then Jesus, can you imagine, right? Woman is at his feet crying away, wiping her, her, her hair on his feet. Tells a story about three different people who owe debt. One small debt, one big debt. Then he asked the Pharisees who are fully in, in self-righteousness and judgmental, and judgmental, judging this woman. He said, who, if he forgives all three, who will be more indebted? And obviously, the Pharisee says, the one who owes more. So Jesus revealed this beautiful, this beautiful thing in, in defense of this woman who is pouring out her heart to Jesus. And he says this, this woman loves much because she knows she's forgiven much. Whereas you guys, you don't think you're forgiven much, so therefore you don't love much, you know? But then when you juxtapose this to the story of Mary of Bethany, both are similar accounts of pouring out their hearts before Jesus. She poured out worship before Jesus. Maybe the timing is wrong. Jesus hadn't died yet. He's still there. This is for burial, right? The, the, the oil of spikenard is for burial. But what did Jesus do? Jesus still acknowledged her and said, for generations, she will be remembered. So I want you to know that these are different Marys. In fact, Mary Magdalene is not in any of these stories. Okay? Different Marys. Now, will the real Mary please stand up? So in Luke chapter 8, verse 1 to 3, it says, After this, Jesus traveled about from one town and village um, to another, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom of God. The twelve were with him, and also some women who had been cured of evil spirits and diseases. Mary called Magdalene, from whom seven demons had come out. Now this is a story of someone who unfortunately, was tormented. You know, when it's spiritual, it's not just physical. She, and she endured two horrific things that came into her life. Evil spirits from within, diseases that manifest on the outside. Poor thing, right? So, Jesus set her free. And this is the Mary Magdalene who showed so much gratitude because she... Not only, is, not, not only do we remember the 12 disciples who were with Jesus, this is someone else 
over and above the 12 that is also given special mention. Do they mention the 12 disciples? Uh uh, but they mention specifically Mary called Magdalene. Magdalene is not her last name, okay? She is from Magdala, a town that is in the west coast of the Sea of Galilee, right? And they, in the next verse, it says that, it talks about other women as well, Joanna, the wife of Chusa, and the manager of Herod's household, Susanna. Well, you see Pastor Peter named two daughters from this already. Maybe she should name Han Chusa or something like that, right? <laughs> and many others, okay? I believe when you say many others, that line, line, they actually refer to women, right? These women, gives you a clue, right? Were helping to support them out of their own means. So Mary Magdalene from Magdala, I venture to guess that she's actually quite well-to-do. But you know what? Instead of living, she's so driven by the graciousness of Jesus that he set her free to a point that she went on to share the wealth, the, to support the disciples. You know, imagine these are big burly guys with an elephant of an appetite, right? They eat a lot, and yet, wow, you know, they, 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 they sacrificed and supported them. And specifically, as you're covering the topic of women, right, these women, aren't you impressed, right? Not only was Mary someone who was, who was completely transformed because she was set free physically and spiritually, she was a she was a strong supporter of Jesus' ministry. She was one of the, the, the uh, over and above the 12, the disciples who were so dedicated, right? Not only that, she's also courage personified. Now, why do I say that? Now, in this verse, it says, and many women followed Jesus from Galilee, ministering to them, were there looking from afar. Among them, among which were Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Joseph, and the mother of Zebedee's sons. Have you lost count of the number of Marys already? So many, so many, right? I can't even say Mary. So Mary, so so many. Gosh. So this is in Matthew chapter 27, verse 55, 56. But before the preceding that, is actually when the centurion saw. Jesus, when he, when, he, when he was on the cross, he gave up his spirit, the earthquake, the darkness over the land. And he says, truly, this is the Son of God. All right? And you can imagine that scenario full of Romans, full of Roman soldiers. But who were hanging out? The disciples, who were mainly men, were chicken. They were not even there. And the people present, women, who followed Jesus from Galilee. And they were so filled with so much courage, they were ministering to him. Even at the tomb, the women were there, right? So what is Mary famous for? I want to share with you this story, which I think is so precious. Because sometimes we remember Mary for maybe like the wrong reasons. For example, I used to think that the woman caught in adultery was Mary Magdalene. Ah, sorry, they didn't mention who it was. So we cannot make assumptions like that, right? But this is clearly stating Mary's name and a story about Mary, right? So she was in a tomb crying. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and she saw two angels in white seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. Interesting because when you look at the Old Testament, when the Ark of the Covenant, there were two cherubim. What were they doing? They had their wings extended, but their eyes were looking down at the mercy seat. And every year, the priest would pour the blood of the sacrifice onto the mercy seat so that when God sees the blood, it's covering the people of Israel. They don't exercise judgment. But in this case, the two angels that were sitting head and at the foot, they were seated. That means it's a finished work. It's done, right? He had raised from he had risen from the dead. That now this Jesus, which 
was in a form that maybe Mary couldn't recognize. He asked her, Mary, a question. Woman, why are you crying? Maybe that's a question that a lot of husbands are asking their wives, right? <laughs> then she answered, they have taken away my Lord, taken my Lord away, she said. And I don't know where they have put him. At this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not realize that it was Jesus. It's interesting because Mary was the chosen one. Jesus chose to appear before Mary, the first person at the resurrection. Now, Jesus asked her, oh, sorry, same question. So thinking Jesus was the gardener, this is Mary, right? She thought that Jesus was the gardener. She said, sir, if you have carried him, away, tell me where you have put him and I will get him. Then Jesus said to her, Mary, I love this. This was preparing this, right? I must confess that, you know, tears started to well up in my eyes because he was such a term of endearment, such a term of affection. It's like Jesus calling you. He's calling your name in a most personal way, telling Mary, I am Jesus. I am here. And some of us need to hear this. You may feel alone. You may feel lost. You may feel that you're, you're such a failure, but only one word, and Jesus call you by name. Jesus knows the number of hairs or the lack of it on your head. That's how close he is to you. And this is the God of heavens and the earth in such a personal, intimate way, calls you by name. Just like he calls this person that he spent so much time with, Mary. And she immediately recognized him. She turned towards him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. And now, we're going to the point. It tells you what is Mary famous for, okay? Jesus said, do not hold on to me for I'm not yet ascended to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I'm ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. First time, clue, friends, First time, it shows you the power of Jesus' sacrifice and over death and sin and what he brought about for redemption because he, did, he didn't just say, my father and my God. He said, my father and your father. My God and your God. Hey, friends, something changed. That power, that that. Power over death. Romans 8, 11, the same power that raised Christ from the dead, quickens your mortal body, brings you that closeness that's so intimate. His spirit not just lives around you, spirit lives in you. God can become your God. Our heavenly father is not just God. You can call him father, just the way Jesus called him. Mary Magdalene went to disciples with the news. I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said thing, these things to her. Friends, Mary is such an example of transformation because she is the first evangelist. God chose a woman. You know, very often women are made fun of and, and women are... Are, are, are joked about, you know, of being gossipers. But even now, as I see the names of the participants in our, in our webinar, our Zoominar, so many women, and I'm so grateful, especially for the women in TNCC. There's so many examples of wonderful women, fine examples in the spirit for my wife and I. And we're so grateful. And Jesus chose Mary Magdalene, a person of questionable past, a, a person that, I mean, if Jesus wanted to pick someone, he definitely could have picked someone more credible, more dependable. A woman of, of a questionable background, of being possessed by demons, having disease. Friends, there is power in grace, power in transformation. And she did not think about herself anymore did not think about her background, her weaknesses, and her lack. She went around sharing frantically about good news. I have seen the Lord. And I think that's something that we can learn. 
powerful. Let's remember Mary, the first evangelist. So this is my last slide, friends. I think as I did this exercise, I'm so grateful for so many things that we can learn about these two women and in general, women in leadership. Now, God calls everybody. He doesn't call just people who are there, who are all together, who have everything good. No, these are two examples of women who, who don't seem to have it all together. But what was different about these people? Why does God include these women in the Bible? Even so special, five of them, again, you name the five in Matthew's, uh, genealogy, questionable. First one, Tamar. Second one, Rahab. Third one, Ruth. Ruth is more uh, Moabitess, not even a, uh, a, 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 a Jew. By the way, Rahab is also accounted for righteousness because she is the grand great-grandmother of Boaz who married Ruth. So Jesus, the lineage of Jesus, even comes through these five that have questionable background. Mention in the genealogy. Why not mention Sarah? Why not mention Susan Hoover? It's like, it's like, uh, mention, you know, some great names, you know, of women, Deborah, you know. Uh, these people are, are, are great na name, great. We know them for good reputation. Why name people questionable like Tamar slept with the father-in-law, you know? You want to know why? Ah, go and study your Bible, okay? Go and look it up. But God had a reason. God had a reason that his son will come through these people, not just the women, but men as well, who were not perfect, but who had faith. So the first thing I want to hand up, share with you, faithfulness. You can tell that Rahab had faith in a God who was not her God. Reminds you of even like Esther, right? You know, a God who's not her God, but she had faith in him. Dedication. Dedicated all the way, like Mary Magdalene. You know, she was so transformed that she get dedicated her life as a disciple. Dedicated in a way that she had the resources and she gave it all to support all the other disciples. Dealing with culture. So many of us, in this day and age, still, I'm talking about the ladies, the women in our church, in the church world, still face some form of bias or, or some, you know, uh, some sort of criticism. I remember once, you know, uh, we, we met a leader and um, he, he said that, oh, you know, this is Susan and I, we met this leader and he just said that, you know what, women are, should not be uh, preaching in TNCC. And... I just kept quiet because I can see, you know, my wife, right, starting to, you know, the, the, the steam starting to come out. But uh, one of the points I'm going to raise is about graciousness. She was very gracious. And she's, because even though this person said that, no, women can only teach uh, children and teach in Sunday school, but not men to teach. I said, hey, you know what, heck care, man, anything that points to Jesus, I'll select the person. So, yes, certain things, certain, certain ideologies try to limit women, try to see women as weaker. Yeah, maybe men may be stronger physically, but I venture to tell you, friends, women are strong mentally and even in many regards, spiritually. I confess, right? My wife is way stronger in every regard, even, even um, from, a, from a position of even in her wisdom. Courage. I shared that uh, when all the disciples, the men ran away, when Jesus hung on a cross, and the women were there, nurturing. How else can, you know, uh, um, the mother from Rahab, right, nurture a strong family? She continued to be a harlot. Hey, man, no Boaz. You know, no kinsman redeemer. So she changed, she, she transformed, and she nurtured the children because they became, they became the captain of uh, Bethlehem. And, and, and that's where 
came, Boaz family came from, right? And I believe it started because when Rahab had a transformation, it resulted in good works. When she had faith, righteousness, the result was good works. Sacrifice. Like I said, the women sacrifice to support the disciples. Humility. I think that in, in so many ways, you know, um, she did not, Mary Magdalene did not immediately see Jesus, but she opened up a heart. She depended on Jesus. She depended on his love, his, his grace, so much so that when he calls her out by name, Mary, immediately she knew it was him. Humility is when we recognize the greatness of God and our own limitations. Wisdom. I was telling you about, you know, my wife, we, we just handed over uh, a property that we were trying to sell for many, many months. And it's very interesting because for some reason, it, it fell apart and then they decided to call all of us to come together to the negotiation table. We said, only if the lawyers are present. All kinds of allegations came and there was a lot of misunderstanding. But I thought, okay, you know what? I trust my wife. My wife has the Holy Spirit and great wisdom. Came along during the, the uh, meeting and for some reason, she turned the whole entire meeting. She is not financially trained, but she presented a compelling reason why the buyer should come back to the table and buy the house. And three months later, last week, done deal. Okay, I thank God. My wife, you know, you asked her, right? If she ever needs to make simple decisions, like what do you want to eat? She cannot eat. But she can make complex life transforming decisions. And I thank God that I can go to my wife because the spirit of Jesus, spirit of wisdom is also in her. Spirit led, I think is very important. These women who risk their lives, either the, who, the one of them, I mean, the one that was Rahab who risked her life was led by the spirit. Even though she told a lie to set off the, the, uh, the pursuers, led to the freedom and led to the occupation of Jericho by the Israelites. And grace. Now, this I just want to end with this other story. Um, my wife was just sharing this story about how in the early days, back in Medan, she used to live in the mountains. And every day, she would take a bus and travel between uh, the, the, the valley and the mountains, you know, to, to do her work. And every day as she sits in the bus, she actually, you know, would pass by a prostitute village. And the reason why I'm saying is because this this story of Rahab the harlot, right? One day she decided and said, you know what? Jesus loves these people as well. They're the lowest of the low, lowest of society. Everybody detests them, but I will go. So she decided to step off the bus and she went and she decided to make friends with this prostitute. Now, if you would get off the bus, it's going to cost a lot of eyeballs, you know, just staring at it. What kind of men, you know, ugh, what kind of men, you know, do this, you know, go to this village. What more woman, okay? You know, imagine a missionary hanging out, you know, with people who are full of tattoos and smoking away, you know, you know, with, uh, uh, with you know, they're unwed, they got children and all. You know what, friends? These people did not choose this life. In fact, I venture to tell you, right, 99.9% hate what they do, but they cannot help it. That's why I love the fact that Jesus is a friend of sinners. He came down where nobody wanted to go. He came to a place where nobody wanted to reach out to. And Susan was led by that. And through her work of befriending these women, one managed to respond. And you know what? There's the power of grace the power of undeserved, unmerited favor when she, this woman, this prostitute, realized how much Jesus loved her and did not count her sins against her because he took every one of her sins on a cross so that Jesus can declare to her, God is your God. 
my father is your father too, when she accepted Jesus. Then you know what? Faith righteousness leads to good works, right? There are results. She was transformed. This prostitute did not continue to be a prostitute. She got changed. And now her life is completely transformed. She reaches out to her fellow prostitute, uh, prostitutes around her as well, encourage them to get out of the profession, try to help them. And I think if I remember, my wife is telling me that she's, she's a stylist now, a, a barber. No one will know the kind of background that she is because she's so transformed. Friends, is what Jesus did for us. Came into our world, our dirty, our horrible world full of pain, and he brought us out so that we can enjoy the abundant life. And I thank God for these examples that I mentioned, namely these two ladies, these two women, you know, showing leadership. And it, in, in most of all, he's telling us that, hey, you know what? Every one of us can experience God's grace. Again, it's not about these women. It's not about Rahab. It's not about Mary Magdalene. But it's an awesome God who's full of grace that transformed their lives. I've ended now. I'd like to hand it over to Jonathan. Okay, Pastor Clint, thank you very much for this. Um, <clears throat> let's do something different today. Instead of just asking Pastor Clint questions, maybe some of you would like to share also on uh, women who have shown God's grace. Yeah, in your life, you've met people like this. Perhaps you would like to share that. Yes, thank you, Jonathan. I think that's great. I like to hear for some from all of you, you know, women. You can type it in the chat. Women that have inspired you, not just from the Bible, can be from TNCC as well. You know, yeah. It seems they don't seem to be speaking much. Pastor Clint, maybe we need to do more on women in our webinars. <laughs> Encourage them more. Yeah. Hmm. Well, we have a lady speaker in our church, and that's fine. Aha, uh -huh. something here. I was blessed and inspired by two ladies when I was a young person. That's from Pastor Ellen. So, Pastor Ellen, perhaps you can unmute the microphone and elaborate how they blessed you. Oh, well, uh, when I was uh, just went to church, I was invited by, I mean, an older lady who has children around my age to uh, invited to, you know, have meals in their home. I think it was those encounters with Christian family, my first encounter with Christian family, how hospitable she was, inspired me to desire to want to have a Christian family. And another old lady gave me a Bible and, you know, always encouraged me. So I think it's partly because of her, I was encouraged to go into full-time ministry. So, and I, I believe this was God's grace to me through these ladies. Thanks. Yeah. Praise God for them, Pastor Ellen. And yeah, look what you've turned out to be. Lovely. Lovely. Come on, some more people. Yeah, while we're waiting, I just wanted to share that my uh, when I was born into a neighborhood, our neighbor, uh, she rounded up all the kids to go to Sunday school. Um, she was a wonderful, wonderful like mother to all of us. And um, we were in Sunday school for a while, but our parents took us out because, you know, there was a lot of bad report about Christians. At the time, there's a very famous TV show called The Guyana Tragedy. I'm not sure if you're old enough to remember that, but it's about cults. You know, a very famous cult that brought that was from America. He had many followers and ended up making all of them drink cyanide. So uh, my parents pulled me out of that uh, Sunday school. But this, this auntie, this lady from our neighborhood, she didn't realize that these are the seeds that were planted in her heart as kids. So now my family, I'm so glad because my sister as well, she's a pastor. 
the husband is a pastor, my wife is a pastor, you know, so I would say that the seeds that were planted by her, she never knew that at least one or two of those people from the neighborhood could accept Jesus and will go on to share the gospel to other people as well. Anybody else? You'd like to type it in the chat? I will read it out. Or maybe in TNCC, it's mainly the men, Pastor Clint. So not much to, for the people to talk about. <laughs> hey, ladies, this is a chance for you as well, you know, to, to have your voice be heard. <laughs> Women who have also inspired you can be from the Bible. Yeah. Okay. Or if you have any questions as well, you know, you can ask. Ah, look who's writing here. I'm thankful <laughs> for many women who have inspired me and our courageous Auntie Stephen and many in TNCC continue to do so. Yeah, all right. So, Pastor Susan, would you like to say a few more words? It's okay because I'm teaching on another woman next week. <laughs> okay, okay. Alrighty. So, in suspense. All right, then, if that's the case, I'm going to call it off so that next week you women get ready to talk and men, you better have some women ready also to share. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, before we go, I'll just uh, come on with the announcements. Let me see if I can find them. Okay, so we continue next week. And uh, as Pastor Susan said, it's going to be another woman. Okay, and then if you haven't joined any of the groups yet, community group, please do so. Okay, so now if you would like to unmute your microphone and show your appreciation to Pastor Clint for sharing with us on Rehab and on Mary Magdalene, you're welcome to do so. So let's hear it for Pastor Clint. Let's make some noise. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Pastor Clint. Thank you, Pastor Clint. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor Clint. 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 You were very good when you did the woman's voice. Good night, everybody. All right. Good night. Shalom. Hey, good night Thanks, all. John. You're welcome. Good night, people. All right. Good night. Have an early Thank night. you, everyone. God bless you.